course he did. How could it be otherwise? He and Marlene were partners for I don't know how many years. Scrooge was his sole executor, his sole administrator, his sole monitor, and his sole friend. And even Scrooge was not so dreadfully cut up by the sad event, but that he was an absolute man of business on the very day of the funeral, and so nice to him with an undoubted bargain. There's no doubt the morning's dead. This must be understood, or nothing wonderful can come of this story we are about to tell.
Christmas a humbug. <laughs> Uncle, you don't mean that, I'm sure. Merry Christmas. What right have you to be merry? What reason have you to be merry? Poor enough. Well, come then. Why would you be so dismal? What reason have you to be so morose or rich enough? Humbug. Well, don't be cross, Uncle. Why shouldn't I be? When I live in such a world of fools as this. Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas. What's Christmas time to you but a time for paying bills with no money? A time for finding yourself a year older and not an hour richer? A time for adding up your books and finding every item in England was it dead against you? You go around puzzle at once. Ah, Merry Christmas. If I had my way, every idiot who goes about with Merry Christmas on his lips would be boiled his own pudding and buried with a stake of holly through his heart. Uncle. Nephew, you keep Christmas in your way. Let me keep Christmas in mine. Keep it. But you don't keep it. Well, then let me leave it alone, then. Much good it may do you. Much good it has ever done in you. But there are many things from which I might have derived good. I wish I had no profit in. I dare say Christmas among the rest. But I am sure I've always thought of Christmas time when it has come around as a good time. As a kind, forgiving, charitable, pleasant time. The only time I know of in a long calendar of the year when men and women seem, by one consent, to open their shut up hearts freely. And to think of people below them as if they really were fellow travelers to the grave. And not some distant, race of creatures bound on other journeys, and they're all uncle, although it has never put a scrap of gold or silver in my pocket. I believe that it has done me good, and will do me good. And I say, God bless it. God bless it, Mr. Fred, here, here! Oh. <laughs> Sir, one more sound out of you, Bob Cratchit, and you'll keep Christmas by losing your situation. Sorry, sir. You're quite a powerful speaker, sir. <coughs> I'm all you don't want for Parliament. Don't be angry, Uncle. Come, join with us tomorrow. But why? Why? Why did you get married? Because I fell in love. Because you fell in love. Good afternoon. <laughs> but Uncle, you've never come to see me before that happened. I give there's a reason for not coming now. Good afternoon. I want nothing from you. I ask nothing of you. Why cannot we be friends? Good afternoon. I am sorry with all my heart to find you so resolute. But you've never had any quarrels which I've been a party. However, I have made the trial and homage to Christmas, and I shall keep my Christmas Eve to the last. So Merry Christmas, Uncle. Good afternoon. Happy New Year. Good afternoon. <laughs> Merry Christmas. There's another one. My clock. Fifteen shillings a week, a wife and family, and he goes about talking Merry Christmas.
There are plenty of prisons. <coughs> and the Union workhouses, are they still in full operation? They are, though I wish I could say they were not. Both are very busy, sir. I was afraid from what you had said that something had occurred to stop them in their useful purpose. I'm very glad to hear it. Under the impression they scarcely provide Christian cheer of mind or body to the multitude, a few of us are endeavoring to raise a fund to buy the poor some meat and drink and means of warmth. We've chosen this time of year because it is a time of all others when want is keenly felt and abundance rejoices. What shall we put you down for, sir? Nothing. You wish to remain anonymous? I wish to be left alone. I do not make merry at Christmas time myself, and I cannot afford to make idle people merry. I support the institutions I have mentioned. They cost enough. Those who are badly off must go there. And he can't go there. And many would rather die. If they would rather die, then they had better do it and decrease the surplus population. It's not my business. It is enough for a man to understand his own business and not interfere with others. My business occupies me constantly. Good afternoon, gentlemen. Sir. Shut up, child, and let me work. At length the hour of shutting up, the counting house had arrived. You want all day off. It's quite convenient, sir. It's not convenient. It's not fair. If I was to dock your pay, I'm proud for it. You think yourself ill-used. Don't think me ill-used to pay a day's wages for no work. Well, it is only once a year, sir. Poor excuse for picking a man's pocket every 25th of December. Yes. Still. I suppose you must have the whole day. Well, be here all the earlier the next morning. Oh, I will, sir. Thank you, Mr. Scrooge. Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas.
labored on it since. It is a ponderous chain. Jacob, oh, Jacob Marley, be comfort to me. I have none to give. No, can I tell you what I would? Very little time has permitted me. I cannot rest, I cannot stay, I cannot linger anywhere. In life, my spirit never walked beyond our counting house. My spirit never rolled beyond the narrow limits of our money-changing home. And weary journeys lie before me. You were always a good man of business, Jacob. Business? Mankind was my business. The common welfare was my business. Charity, mercy, forbearance, benevolence were all
Are you the spirit who's coming was foretold to me? I am. Who and what are you? I am the ghost of Christmas past. Long past? No, your past. The things that you will see with me are shadows of the things that have been. They will have no consciousness of us. Why are you here? For your welfare. Now.
My dear Belle, I have something to ask you. Ebenezer?
never. But spirit conduct me where you will. The last spirit taught me lessons which are working now. If you have something to teach me, I would hope to profit by it. Touch my robe. I 
Uh, he's a calm fellow, fellow, that's the truth. And certainly not as pleasant as he might be. However, I am certain that other scooters and princes carry their own conscience. It is not for me to say anything against you. I'm sure he's very rich, Fred. And what of that, my dear? Well, his wealth is of no use to him. He does no good with it. He won't make himself comfortable with it. He hasn't even the satisfaction of knowing he's going to help us. Well, I have no patience for it. Oh, I have. I'm sorry for him. I could be angry with him if I tried. Well, who suffers by his ill whims? Himself. Always. Here. He takes it into his head to dislike us. He won't come and dine with us, and what's the consequence? He loses on some pleasant moments which can certainly do no harm. I mean to give him the same chance year after year, whether he likes it or not. For I pity him. He may rail at Christmas until he dies, but if I go there every year and get together, he can't help but think better of it. Maybe he'd even think to leave his poor clock 50 pounds. <laughs> if I could only put him in the vein to leave that poor man 50 pounds, that's all. Oh, come on, dear. Just discuss something more pleasant. Oh, I know. Let's sing some carols. Oh, yes. My daughter can start.
not speak to me. The night is waning fast, and the time is precious to me, I know. Lead on, spirit. Lead on.
My life has taken that way. Good heaven. What is this? Spirit, this is a dreadful place. In leaving it, its lesson shall not be lost on me. You can trust me. Let us go. I feel our parting moment is at hand. 
I know it, but I know not how. Tell me, what man was that with the covered face whom we saw lying dead?